Okay. Bear with me as some people are still coming in. And um, it's going to let those people in. Okay. So let's get started. This week's Torah portion. So first of all, actually, uh, before we begin, happy July 4th to all our American friends <laughs> and um, American participants. I'm actually half American, if you could say that, to my mom. <laughs> so I actually have American citizenship um, to my mother's, uh, my mother. So um, I always, I've always identified uh, even though I, I was born in Canada and grew up in Canada, I've always identified very strongly, a part of me identifies very strongly with the US of A uh, because my mother's from there and her entire family's from there. And my husband is from there and his entire family's from there. So we're kind of the outliers living in Canada. And uh, growing up, I spent all my special moments with my grandparents who uh, lived in the United States. So my grandmother and my, my, my grandparents. And, uh, and so I definitely have a connection and my children um, also uh, study in the United States and some of them live in the United States. So happy July 4th and uh, may God bless America. <laughs> and uh, let's get started on this week's Torah portion. So this week's Torah portion the name of the Torah portion is called Chukat. Chukat means decree or injunction, and it usually relates to the type of decree that we find <clears throat> in, the Jewish, in the Jewish tradition where there is a certain enigmatic or, or a spiritual or mystical component to the decree or to the law. So as we know, there are three types of or three subsets of laws in Torah. There is the chukim, or the chok, or the chukat, like this week's Torah portion. And then there is the mishpatim, and then there is the edut. So the chukim are the laws which are what we call super rational laws, laws that seem to define, seem to defy actually rational explanations. So some, a lot of these laws are mystically inclined. And some of them we try to understand, and some of them we do understand, but some really remain out of the purview of understanding, meaning that we don't see how the act of the law reflects a divine truth, but we do it anyway. And an example of that, and this week's Torah portion opens up with that example, is the example of the para aduma, the red heifer that was slaughtered and burned to a crisp and its ashes were used in a ritual mixed with water to sprinkle on someone who had come in contact with the dead. And that was part of a ritual, including going to the mikvah that allowed the person to be allowed to go back into the temple and to temple services. And the question is why the ashes of a red heifer would relieve someone from the status of being tamela met, of being defiled by death when the people who were involved in the process became defiled by, by uh, certifying the process. And so that is a, one of the enigmas of the Torah. Another type of law that would fall into the, this type of law of chukat would be shotness, the, the prohibition to wear an admixture of wool and linen. The rabbis say the laws of kosher fall into this notion of chukas and the laws of mikveh. So all the laws that seemingly have a super rational aura to it are the laws of chukat. And then of course we have the mishpatim, which, which are the civil laws, which we can relate to as human beings. And the rabbis even go as far as to say that if the civil laws were not given to Moses at Mount Sinai, we would have, we would have to make them up or that we would have figured them out by ourselves. So that there's a certain there's a certain rationality to the laws. So don't kill, don't steal. The laws of respecting parents. These are the frameworks of a healthy society that that we find in other cultures. And so the Torah says these are the civil laws that the the mishpatim. And then of course there's the laws of the edut 
and the Eidut are the laws that are specific to the history of the world and history of uh, God's connection to the Jewish people. So those would be the laws of Shabbat and the laws of Passover and the laws of Shavuot and Sukkot and Rosh Hashanah and so on and so forth. So those are the three types of laws. And the name of this week's Torah portion is Chukas. And the reason why the Torah portion is called Chukas is because the Torah portion opens up with the law of the red heifer. But today that is not going to be the subject of our discussion. It's only to give you an overview about the, the opening of this week's Torah portion. And I think that although we are not going to discuss the red heifer today, we're going to discuss a very a, a fascinating account that happens in the narrative of the Jewish people and that involves Moses in the desert. And we're gonna get into that in a minute, which is the story of the um, Moses striking the rock. However, it is a, there is a truism that the name of the Torah portion often reflects a subcontext or a subtext that's found in the Torah portion. And I would, I would venture to say that although I entitled this class Between a Rock and a Hard Place, because it is about Moses' untenable situation when he struck, he struck the rock and what it meant for Moses and what it meant for the Jewish people and what we can derive from that narrative it is, you could all equal, this Torah portion could equally be called enigma because there are a couple of stories that happen in this week's Torah portion that are truly enigmatic and the laws are also enigmatic. So it starts off, it almost gives the flavor of the Torah portion. The enigma of the red heifer is followed by the enigmatic story of Moses striking the rock and later on the equally mysterious story of the, the Jewish people and their incidents with the snakes in the desert, which we're gonna, we're not going to be, which is not gonna be the subject of our discussion, but I'll be happy to take questions about it later if you would like to, to get into it, just because of time, each of these stories are actually quite full and each one requires its own time. And in fact, when I was preparing the Torah portion, I was like, copper snake, copper snakes, rock, snakes, rock, they're so, they're so interesting and they both have so much to teach us. But I went with the rocks because it's about Moses this time. And today I wanna to talk about Moses and his, his curtailing of his mission that he, that, he uh, that, that, that is presented to him in this week's Torah portion. So suffice it to say though, that this entire Torah portion does carry the, uh, I guess the shadow of enigma and this week's, this week's Torah portion um, and the story of Moses and the rock is no exception. And that is gonna be our subject that we're going to get into today. Just as an overview of this week's Torah portion. In this week's Torah portion, we have, first and foremost, we have the story of the red heifer and the laws of the red heifer. And then the Torah portion fast forwards and says, you know what, where we are, where we're at now, and this is very interesting in, in, in the Torah, in the Chumash, it's like you can go from, you know, you can go from one period to another period and you can kind of zoom through a, a large chunk of time, perhaps because nothing, very important happened during that time. And so the Torah portion brings us to literally the last year of the journeying of the desert. And the Torah tells us that the Jewish people arrive in the, in the, in the wilderness of Tzin. And there Miriam dies. And because Miriam dies, the blessing that Miriam carries with her and that she brought to the Jewish people for 40 years in the desert, which is the blessing of abundance of water, also shrivels up with Miriam's death. And the Jewish people suddenly find themselves very thirsty for water and they cry to Moses and in their classical way of complaining, they kind of go, <laughs> they kind of go back to, you know, we sh this shouldn't have happened and that shouldn't have happened. Like what we, we often do when we are not having a very healthy argument, when we kind of bring up the past and we, dredge up the past and all the problems in the kitchen sink. And Moses is told to speak to the rock. And when he will speak to the rock, the water will flow. And as, as we know, this is the second time Moses has this encounter with a rock and water. 
but this time it doesn't go very well. We're going to get into that aspect of this week's Torah portion. In this week's Torah portion as well, we're, we're informed that Aaron dies and that his son Elazar takes over. We're also told that venomous snakes attack the, uh, the, the camp of Israel after they speak against Moses and God, and that God heals them through telling Moses to put a serpent on a, on a stick and, and look at the serpent and they get healed. And finally, they have these battles against the Amorite kings of Sichon and Og, and they conquer the lands that are east of Jordan. So this is really, in a nutshell, the speaks to our portion. But the subject of our tour portion today is going to be this very fascinating section of the, 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 the section where the Jewish people have no water, they complain to Moses, and, the, and, and then what happens as a result. Okay, so I'm going to, we're going to go into the text itself. And let me just uh, pull up the text very quickly. We go. So here we are. We are we are in the Torah portion of Hukat, the second the second portion of it, and the Torah tells us that the Jewish people arrived at the desert of Sin. I guess Sin was a very arid desert, and they settled in the area of Kadesh. And Miriam died there, and she was buried there. And Rashi asked the question. But Tamasha Miriam, Rashi says, why does the Torah tell us that Miriam died there? And Rashi says, Lama Nismacha Parshas Nisus Miriam La Parshas Paraduma. Why does the Torah portion of Miriam's death, why is it juxtaposed with the passage of the red cow to teach you, Lamerlacha, Maksha Karbanis, Mechaprin, just like just like uh, uh, um, offerings bring atonement, af misa in the so too the righteous through their passing secure atonement for, for, the, for the community. And that is a very, very deep concept that somehow when uh, that the, the passing of a tzaddik brings atonement and that's really out of the subject of our discussion today, but I wanna mention it here because Miriam is a prototype of the Jewish woman in the desert and so the Torah is telling us that Miriam's death is very impactful to the Jewish people. And, and, and the Torah tells us that they had no water, okay? There is no water for the community, and they congregate against Moses and Aaron. So they're, they're complaining again, they have no water. And uh, Rashi says here, Rashi notes the fact that suddenly they have no water, that there's no water for the community. And Rashi teaches us here, From here we learn that all the 40 years that they were in the desert, they had water in the merit of Miriam. So we obviously must take a moment to, to pay tribute to Miriam. We say about water, water mayim chayim, water is life. Without water, there is no life. And we know that nothing can grow without water. That any, any, any form of life requires water. And so we know that when they're looking for life on other planets, what do they look for? They look for water because where there is water, there will be life. And where there is no water, there cannot be life. And so we see that Miriam becomes the epitome. She, per, she epitomizes life itself and, she, and the, the well is in her merit. And Rashi quotes the, the Talmud in, in, in Titus. And the Talmud of Titus goes into a whole discussion. And the Talmud says there, is it possible that a merit comes to the Jewish people only through the, the, only through the merit of one person? Is it possible that the Jewish people could be blessed with something only through the merit of one person? And the Talmud goes into different explanations how this is possible. And it brings as proof positive that this is true by saying that yes, because we know that 
as long as Miriam was alive, there was water. And as soon as Miriam died, the water dried up. And so the Talmud of Tainus says this. Here, here we have the Talmud of Tainus. And the, the, the question is, is raised, can it, can it be that a person, one person can bring marriage to the Jewish people? And the Talmud says, yes, indeed. In fact, the Jewish people during the time of the desert had three people who brought them blessing. And who were these? Moshe, Aaron, and Miriam. These are Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. And three great gifts were given through them. And these were the 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 uh, well, the well which, which was in the merit of Miriam, the Anan, the cloud which was in the merit of Aaron, Ulman, and the Mana which was in the merit of Moses. So Be'er besfus Miriam, Anun Anan besfus Aharon, Ulman besfus Moshe. Mesa Miriam, Nistalik Haber. Miriam dies and the, the water disappears. Shenemar, like it says in the Sixth Torah portion, Batamasha Miriam. And Miriam died there, Oksiv Basre, and it says, and there was no water for the community. So just as an aside, we see that the, 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 the greatness of righteous people is that they bring blessing to all of them around, around them. And Miriam brings this blessing to the Jewish people, not just a blessing, but it could be argued the most vital of all blessings. Without water, there is nothing. And water also is a euphemism for Torah. So Miriam, the, the sister, the older sister of Moses, who is the prophetess, who, who prophesizes that Moses is going to be born and prophesizes that he's going to be great to the Jewish people and is his support throughout the years, she passes away. And with her passing, we are bereft of water. And so this is, this is really a, a, a moment, I think, to, to pay tribute to Miriam and the Torah recognizes. And we see that there's trouble that happens to the Jewish people as a result of Miriam's passing, which is suddenly they are literally very, very thirsty. There's no water to drink and there's no water to refresh themselves with. And they become so overheated and they become so desperate that they start to attack Moses and Aaron and they cry to them and they say, why did you bring us here to die? It would have been better to die in the plague. And as you know, when someone is exceptionally thirsty, when a person is so thirsty, we can fast. A person is, has the capacity to fast as long as they drink. But if a person does not drink, they are, their, their electrolytes get depleted and in short order, they actually become they can become dangerously ill. And so the, the Jewish people become desperate for water and the desperation is felt in the text. And this is where our story starts. This desperation that is created by the absence of Miriam and the Jewish people are bereft and they're overwhelmed and they, they are short, they're short uh, uh, spirited. And Moses too is, is short spirited. Everyone is, really tired and very, very thirsty. And imagine being thirsty in a regular day, but how much more so to be thirsty in the desert. I once was thirsty in the Israeli desert. I went to, I went to, uh, to, to the uh, Dead Sea, uh, to, the, to, the, uh, to the waterfalls um, near the Dead Sea, and I did not bring enough water. And I remember, remember this sense of terrible thirst um, the sense of terrible thirst. Just a second, let me just shut. <laughs> Everything is beeping, <laughs> um, and and so you, really you can sense the desperation. So let's get into this. Into this, what happens to Moses as a result of the desperation that the Jewish people are suffering as a result of this terrible thirst that they suddenly have as a result of Miriam's passing. Okay, so let's get into the into the text. Uh, where are we? Here we go. So the Jewish people quarrel with Moses and they say, okay, have we, have, you know, if we only had died in the desert, we heard this before. And why did you bring us here? Why did you take us out of Egypt to bring this, this 
you know, place where we don't see seeds, we don't see fig trees, we don't see grapevines, we don't see pomegranates, and there's no water to drink. So the fig trees, they're not, they're not saying that there, there, there are fig trees in Egypt here. They're just saying, well, really, we don't see anything. We don't see the promised land. All we see is that we are very, very thirsty. So Moses and Aaron go in front of God, and they pray to God, and they become overwhelmed, and God appears to them. Next section. And God gives Moses an instruction. By Yedaber Hashem Moshe Lemur, God says to Moses, he says, Kaha Samata, take your stick, or the stick, actually, if you want to be very precise, and we should be very precise. Take the stick, gather the people, you and Aaron and your brother, and speak to the rock in front of everyone. Vinasa Maimav, and the rock will give its water. And you will evoke water from the, the rock. And you will be able to give the congregation and the livestock to drink. So Moses takes the staff, like God told him. He takes the staff, and this is what the Torah tells us. Moses and Aaron gather before the rock and they say to the Jewish people, listen, you rebels. Do you think we can draw water for you from this rock? This is interesting language. Moses gathers the Jewish people and he's short-tempered with them. And he says, listen, you rebels. You think... Can we gather water from this rock? So on the face of it, it seems that Moshe, Moshe is very upset. And why is he calling them rebels? They're complaining that they have no water. They're very thirsty. In the past, we see that Moses prays on their behalf when they're very thirsty or they're hungry or whatever it is that they need. And here he says, listen, you rebels. So the question is, why, why does he call them rebels? And Rashi says, Rashi addresses this, and he, he quotes the Medrash Tanchuma to explain this. Rashi says as follows. Why does Moshe say, Hamin Hasela, Naiti, from this rock, do you think from this rock we will take out some water? What happened over here? So Rashi says, the fish Yamakira, and I say they couldn't find the rock. Because the rock kind of settled and fell down when the well departed. So they didn't see the rock. And, and the children of Israel said to Moses, What difference does it make from which rock you draw for us the water? Because Moses was looking for the rock that he thought the water would be drawn from. So this is why Moses says to them, Hamayrim Sabranim. He teaches us, he says to them, You are you are rebels and you are fools. Okay. And he says, because he says, Do you think, he says to them, You think you think that we can um, we can uh, draw water if we were not instructed to draw water? So you see what was happening here is that there's a lack of confidence. The Jewish people are saying to Moses, what's going on? Like, are you gonna be able to draw water from this rock? And Moses is looking for a specific law. And it seems like it's not going right away. That's, there's a problem. So what happens? Moshe raises his hand, he strikes the rock with his staff, twice, once, and once again, and an abundance of water gushed forth. And all of a sudden, there is a lot of water uh, for, the, for the congregation. Rashi asked the question, why does Moses have to strike the water twice? And so Rashi says, because he actually struck the water once and only a few drops came out, which is Rashi, but God did not tell him to do what? God did not tell Moses to do what? 
to to strike the rock. To strike the rock, to strike the rock. To only the, to talk to the talk to the rock. So he struck the rock. Only a few drops came out the first time. It's almost like, <laughs> hey, what are you doing? You're not supposed to. It's almost like a warning to Moses. You're not supposed to strike. You're supposed to talk. So Moses struck it again, and then a lot of water came out. And then immediately afterwards, we have a verse that creates a discussion in the Torah that is very vociferous. And I think almost never resolved. And suddenly God says to Moshe, Hashem Moshe bel Aaron, God says to Moses and Aaron, Ya'an lai bi, because you did not believe in me. Lehikdishani le'ene b'nei Yisrael to sanctify my name in front of the Jewish people. Lachain, therefore, lai'savi'u el kahalazeh, you will not bring this assembly el ha'aretz asher nasati lahem to the land that I have given them. And Rashi says, what, what happened here? Because you did not have, uh, have faith in me, Rashi says, um, Rashi says that the Torah is kind of hinting or revealing that if not for the sin, they would have gone into the land. Okay? It should not be said about Aaron and Moses that they died with the, with, with the entire congregation, okay? And here we're told that no, he, he's not allowed to go into the land because he did not sanctify God's name. And Rashi explains, because had you spoken to the rock, because had you and it would have given forth water, then you would have sanctified myself in, in the eyes of the congregation, and you would have taught them an important lesson. And what was the lesson? that look at this rock that has is so inanimate, that has no needs, is able and can listen to God's commandment. So how much more so it is true? Sorry, sorry, sorry. I just trying to get this person. How much more so is this true for all of us? So basically, there's this, this notion that, oh, Moses and Aaron lost a tremendous an opportunity, and their opportunity was to sanctify God's name. I'm sorry for scrolling this, I just lost the page. And therefore, you're not going into the land, okay? And lachain le tevio, therefore, you're not going to um, 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 come into the land. And Rashi says, that God says this, you are not going, like in an, an affirmative injunction, you are not going. And Rashi says, the Shema, it's almost like God is swearing to Moses. And the reason why he's saying this is such strong language, Rashi says, is that God, that, that they should not, that Moses should not pray about this. He should not even discuss this with God. And then we, the name of the place is called May Mariva. These are the waters of dispute because they disputed with God and God um, sanctified the place. And this is why it was, it, was, it, was, uh, it was called this way. And Rashi brings us an interesting uh, idea. He says that Rashi says that we know that the astrologers, we know from the Medrash, that the astrologers said that when Moses was, was, when Moses was born, the astrologer said a great Jewish leader is going to be born that is going to save the Jewish people and take them out of the exile. He's going to rebel against Pharaoh, but his nemesis and his Achilles heel and the thing that is going to do him in is going to be water. And so this is why Pharaoh decreed that all the males should be thrown into the water. 
because he, his, his astrologer saw that whoever was taking Moses out of the land of Israel, sorry, taking the Jewish people out of the land of Israel, Moses, not, they didn't know it was Moses, is somehow going to be vulnerable when it comes to water. So they decreed that they should all, all the newborn males should be thrown into the water. And here, what they were actually seeing, says the Medrash, and Rashi brings this down, is that it was that it was this water, it was this issue with the water that would destroy the Jewish people, the destroy Moses rather. So here we see that they're called Hema Mebariva. So Rashi says this is this is what Pharaoh's astrologers foresaw. And this is why they they commanded that everyone will be. Uh, every newborn son should be cast into the Nile. So that is the story, the way it is brought down in the Torah. And of course, it is one of the most hotly contested, debated, and um, commentated on little section of Torah. Because on the face of it, it, it doesn't really make sense to say that Moses, who led the Jewish people took them out, was a faithful servant, stood up for them time and time again, and is coming so close to the land of Israel. And suddenly now, because he, he misunderstands or chooses to misunderstand or doesn't do something so perfectly where he is supposed to speak to the rock and he hits the rock instead, that suddenly Moses is not allowed to go into, into the land of Israel, it seems to be an excessive punishment. And not only that, if we go back into the text, remember I, I mentioned that the Torah tells us, we go back right into the text to the beginning of the story, that the Torah tells us right at the very beginning, let's look at this a little bit more carefully. God gives Moses a commandment. He says to Moshe, Ka ches hamate. Take the staff, take the staff and gather the people and speak to the rock. And, and then you will, and then you will, um, you will speak to the rock before them that it can give its water. And then you will extract water from the rock. It's not such a far uh, suggestion to say that this leaves a lot of room for ambiguity and confusion. If Moses was meant to speak to the rock and not hit it, why does God tell him to take the stick? Not only that, in the language of the Pasa, we see, he says, Dibartem Elasela, you will speak, in other words, you will both speak to the rock, lay a name in front of them, Benasa Memav, it will give of its water, and then the and you will bring forth the water. So the first is a is an injunction that the rock will give the water, but then it changes it to almost like a uh, instruction that you will take out the water from the rock. So from the language of the Torah itself, first of all, that Moses is told to take his to take the stick, not Histic, and I'm, I'm being very careful with the language of take the stick and not histic for a reason. And you'll see why soon when I, I go into one of the great commentaries on, the, on, on this little section here, this uh, commentary of the rugged Chavar Gain, we're gonna go into that in a minute. But just on the face of it, it seems that God was setting Moses up because he says, take the staff, speak to the rock, the rock will give forth its water and then you shall, shall bring forth the water for them to drink. And so it's almost like God was setting Moses up. So if that is the case, and there's so much ambiguity regarding this injunction, all the more so shouldn't there be the benefit of the doubt for the man who for 40 years invoked the benefit of the doubt for the Jewish people? I mean, here was Moses always finding a good word to say, well, God, they didn't mean it. And here he's making a mistake. Granted, the Torah tells us a mistake, but look at this, the circumstances surrounding this mistake. 
take the stick the water will and the water will come from it but you will you will extract the water from it there's so much ambiguity that can't moses be forgiven in that context to say he struck the water he struck the rock what is moses sin so grievous that this denies him entry into his one dream the dream of taking the jewish people into the land of israel so clearly there is so much commentary. And I think that at the end of everything, before we get into the commentary and what the commentary can teach us, I think that I'm gonna start off with, I'm gonna start off by saying this. At the end of everything, the, and we're gonna go into the many commentaries on this Torah portion. And the truth is that there's, there's, there's so much and there's a discussion between the commentators. They each negate, negate, negate the other. Oh, it must be this. It must be that. Because no one can find a satisfactory answer. But I'm going to pause at this. That after we're going to finish elaborating and bringing out the classic commentaries on this week's Torah portion, and also the esoteric commentaries on this week's Torah portion, I'm going to say this, that at the end of the day, a part of it is going to have to be that the answer to this question lies in the name of this week's Torah portion, which is hukas, which is enigma, which is we don't really know. And I think if we go with that, if we go with that uh, approach, then we can now go into the different opinions that are offered about why Moses was denied entry into the land of Israel for this sin. Because on the face of it, all these opinions will have something to offer, but because, because you see that each commentary does not accept the opinion of the other commentary as the reason, it means that they find there's something dissatisfying or not complete. We know that Rashi, when he brings multiple commentaries, it's because he finds that there's something to be learned from each commentary, but somehow the, each commentary on its own doesn't do the job. So I want to pause it and say that at the end of everything, we're going to have to chalk this up to one of the great mysteries of the universe with a humility that Moses had to say there are certain things that we don't understand. And at the end of it, it's not a cop out to say this, it actually gives us peace to say we, we can't understand everything as great as we are and as gifted as we are. And not only that, as, as much as we are commanded to try to understand, some things stay out of our purview. But that being said, let's get into the commentaries and let's let's do let's let's yes try to understand what they say about the reason for Moses Moses' big mistake and why this would translate into such an epic denial of Moses' dream to go into the land of Israel. So I want to share a couple of commentators. Okay, I'm not going to go into the original. Uh, because um, they are they are very lengthy, and I want to be able to get to the bottom line of each of the commentators to give you a, a feeling of each of the commentators of what they what they say. So I'm going to give you a um, a summary of each of the commentators, and then we're going to we're going to go into a, a different realm, which is a more esoteric realm. So we have. Um, we have Rashi, which we, we saw inside. Rashi says, well, he had an opportunity to make a Kiddush Hashem. He had an opportunity to sanctify God's name, and he didn't do it. And Rashi says, from here, we understand the import of our um, a sensitivity that we have to have, that when we have an ability to bring, uh, bring grace to God's name, we should take it very, very seriously. So that itself is a beautiful lesson that as, as Jews, it, besides doing the right thing, we also have to make sure that our actions are something that reflect well on God. And we know that God forbid, when somebody who is an obviously uh, observant Jew commits something that is not in not in keeping with God's will, the desecration is very serious and almost irreparable. And it makes us cringe and there's nothing we can do about it. 
So Rashi says that's the lesson that we're supposed to take. And maybe by, by uh, you know, um, taking a magnifying glass to Moses, God is teaching us a much greater idea, which was we have to be really, really careful about sanctifying God's name and the opposite, not missing an opportunity to sanctify it and not to desecrate it. And of course, I know I can hear the uh, I can hear the cynics in the you know in in the crowd, and I can hear you know the cynics in my mind. Why so strict? So there has to be it has to be said that our rabbis say when it comes to sages being really held to a very, very deep standard or a higher standard, there is the notion of that God is very careful or overly judgmental when it comes to righteous people because more is expected of them. So God is as nitpicking with them as, as the difference between a, a strand of hair. So that's Rashi, Nachmanides. Nachmanides says, the Ramban, um, Moshe ben Nachman, not Maimonides, Nachmanides. He takes a position that Moses, hitting the rock wasn't the real sin. Uh, the real sin was they, the words that they use. They said, can, can we draw water from this rock? And Nachmanides says, what was this idea that they said, can we draw water from this rock? They were implying that they had the, they had the power to perform the miracle. And we know that human beings have no power to perform a miracle. All, all a human being has the, the, the um, is blessed. God performs the miracle, but he allows it to happen through a human being. But a human being does not have an independent power to create a miracle. And, um, and so Rashi says that it was because they used the words, can we draw water? They implied that, that it was somehow coming from their own strength. And so, so Nachmanavi sees this as a warning to someone who is a leadership, not to become so, um, self-satisfied with their position of power to start to think that the blessing doesn't come from God. That's Nachmanides. Maimonides takes a different position. And Maimonides says, no, this, this is not about um, hitting the rock per se, and it was not even about the language that they used. It was that when he said to the Jewish people, Shimu Nahamayrin, listen you here rebels, he was angry and he was angry at people who were thirsty and the anger was not justified. And therefore, because their thirst was justified and therefore he was punished because Maimonides, by the way, is famously known for, um, for his concern with anger. In fact, we know about Maimonides that, he, that uh, Maimonides is famous for his idea of shvil hazahab. Maimonides says that a person should always live by the golden rule, the golden mean, which is to be um, balanced. Maimonides says, don't be overly generous, no overly stingy, don't be, you know, don't be, um, don't be too confident, don't be, you know, um, to, uh, to, to worried. Maimonides always posits that whatever a person does, they should take the middle path. And Maimonides says the middle path is the healthy way to live. Except, says Maimonides, there, there is one area that a person should not take the middle path. And that area is in the area of anger. Maimonides says that when it comes to anger, um, you should be exceedingly, exceedingly careful against anger. And my mother says, Nabi Shval Ruach would make Kol Adam be exceedingly, exceedingly, um, um, I guess, in a calm spirit so that you should, you should never come to anger. And, and therefore, 
don't even um, show a vestige of anger unless it is for a specific educational purpose and it's not, it's not you who is becoming angry. But Maimonides is very, very careful about anger and Maimonides says therefore that a person who is a wise person should never, ever, ever raise their voice because what happens when we raise our voice is that we can become angry. You know, we say what comes first, the chicken or the egg? Is it that we become angry and therefore we raise our voice? Or is it that we raise our voice and then we become angry? So the truth is, so psychologists know this, that um, acting in a certain fashion actually makes us more inclined so that in that fashion, so that if we, we feign anger, we can become angry. Raising our voice makes us, ha makes us more angry. Speaking in a lower voice actually gets our our emotions in check and it creates a calmness around us. If we're very upset, if we take a deep breath and we don't lash out, we're actually less likely to get angry. So Maimonides says, Moses did something which a leader can never do, which is he got angry at people who were just, um, he, they were just thirsty. And again, here is an important lesson. Like if we are in a position of power as parents, as educators, and a child, a student needs something from us and we don't have the patience for them, we, we, we're, we're lose, we're, we lost something. So that's another interpretation on this uh, on this story. Then we have Evan Ezra and Evan, Evan Ezra says that Moses was, was uh, supposed to, if Moses would have hit the rock once, it wasn't that he hit the rock that was a problem, it was that he hit it twice and the second time um, was 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 too much, and the second time was showing that he didn't have faith. So, so you have you have all these interpretations, and uh, again, a plethora of interpretations. We have the Medrash Yalkut Shimoni that teaches us that Moshe did four sins. He hit the rock when he should have spoken to it. He should have brought water from other rocks as well. He said, "Can we draw water from the rock?" and God wanted him to speak to the rock and, and to say Torah over the rock, and he didn't. And um, we have, we have, uh, we have, the, 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 the sin was that, that, God, that God wanted to show Moses that, you know, he could, he could create any kind of miracle for the Jewish people. And then by hitting the rock, it seems like it's less of a miracle, right? Because when you speak to a rock and water comes out, well, that's very supernatural. But if you hit the rock, well, it could be there was always water there, and all you did was move the rock for the water to come out. Now, the Abarbanel comes from a different perspective, and the Abarbanel says, no, there was no sin here, really. Moses made a mistake, true. I mean, it was a mistake. And, and, you, uh, and you know, no one is infallible, not even Moses. Um, but that was not the mistake. That was not the real issue. The real issue is that Moses was never meant to go into the land of Israel. And the reason why Moses was not meant to go into the land of Israel, um, according to the Barbanel, is because he sent the spies or any other reason. And God wanted to cover up uh, that. And so he gives this kind of little sin so that a, this little sin is attached to Moshe and Moshe is kind of exonerated and he doesn't look like he's like everybody else the, the generation of the desert but he is he had a small sin and yes god was more strict than he should have been with a regular person and so it shows a certain um it shows a certain um uh, you know it's kind of you know it says oh god was just being really 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 strict with them so it takes a little bit of the pressure off of moses um, another fascinating encounter, uh, a fascinating uh, uh, interpretation, comes from the Rogesh, Rogesh Gohan, who was who was a, a great sage of, of the, ninth, the, the, uh, the 19th and 20th century. Actually, the Rebbe studied at, uh, with the Rogesh Gohan. Um, and the Rogesh Gohan says something as follows. This is, again, more esoteric, so bear with me for a second. But the, the Rogesh Gohan says that when God told Moses, take the stick, and as I mentioned a couple of times, he said, the stick, as hamata, the stick. Moses took Aaron's stick. 
And God did not tell Moses which stick to take. He said, take the stick. And Moses took Aaron's stick, perhaps out of humility. And the Rugged Shepherd Gon says that Moses' stick was not, was not like Aaron's stick. Aaron's stick was made out of wood. And Moses' stick was made out of sapphire or precious stones. And by hitting the rock with the wood, he changed the status of the water in, uh, in a way that was not good. Where had he hit the rock with the, um, or touched the water with the, the stick made out of, uh, the, the stick made out of the sapphire, it wouldn't have had the same impact. What was the difference? A very, it's an esoteric idea, but still I thought it was a very beautiful idea. So I'm gonna share that with you. And the Rocket Chavagon says that essentially um, in the laws of purity, in the laws of mikveh, a wood can, can be mitama. Wood can carry, can change the status of water to impure because wood can carry impurity. Stone is pure and never carries impurity. So by hitting the water with the stick, with the wood, Moses disqualified the water as a mikveh, as a mikveh for a woman to use. And had he used the stick that had the stones, it wouldn't have disqualified the water. And as a result, the women could not immerse in it. And this caused that young couples or families could not be intimate. And this is why Moses was punished. He was punished because he blocked the women from going to the mikveh. So I thought that was very interesting because we have here a connection to Miriam. Miriam is the reason why there is water. And here you have the Rugged Shepherd go say, what was Moses' sin? The sin of Moses was that he contaminated the water a bit and now it was not able to be used by people who had to immerse in it, namely the Jewish woman. Namely, the Jewish woman could not have relations with her husband and this is the reason why. So, because it, 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 it hurt the young couples and hurt the family unit. And this is, I found to be a very interesting um, off the beaten track kind of uh, interpretation that, that the Rokhachev brings and the Rebbe brings his teaching um, and all of these teachings that I mentioned in a commentary that the Rebbe has on this question of how is it that Moses is so severely punished. But finally, the Rebbe concludes with this interpretation. And I think this is something that is, uh, it kind of, it, 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 it just, it shows actually the, the mindset of not only um, of the, the Rebbe who teaches this, which is the fifth Chabad Rebbe, the, the Rebbe Rashab, um, the Rebbe Shalom Dovber of Chabad, who taught this idea when he expounded on this, on this Pasuk in a Hasidic discourse. And this is what the Rebbe Rashad teaches. And bear with me, because it is a highly esoteric idea, but it's such a beautiful idea. And I think if you bear with me, um, you'll be able to grasp what is taught here. Very deep, but again, when we go into the esoteric ideas, I think we have a resolution for a conflict that we don't find. It's almost like you're going to the underground well for the source of the water, because what is above the water is not satisfactory. And for me, I know that every single one of the commentators that are mentioned, they, they do shed light on why Moses can't go into the land of Israel, but they're not 100% satisfactory. And therefore, I would say they still fall onto the realm of this big puzzle of why this one act disqualifies Moses from going into the land of Israel, Moses and Aaron for that matter. Here comes the teaching of the Rebbe, Mah the Rebbe Rashab. The Rebbe Rashab says as follows that the Zohar, the Tikkuni Zohar say that the rock that Moses hit represented Torah. The water that, was, that came from the rock and the speaking of the rock represented a almost miraculous understanding of Torah. So that had Moses spoken to the rock and the, the, the water would have flown through it would have been a supernatural event, not only in the terms of the Jewish people getting water, but even more than that, the Jewish people getting inspiration, the Jewish people getting Torah. In other words, they would have had it served to them on a beautiful platter. And Moses felt that if the Jewish people would have had both the water, the physical water, 
given to them easily. And also what it represented it on an esoteric level, the Torah that they would understand without effort, that something um, untowards would, would be also be part of that process. Says the Rebbe Rashad, quoted by the Rebbe, that if the Jewish people would have had this handed to them, so on a physical level, it means water. On a spiritual level, it would mean the Torah that they would understand just by osmosis without having to struggle. They would never really have ownership of the Torah. They would never really have ownership. It would always be, they would always be vulnerable to the next uh, to, to the next problem, meaning that when something is handed to you on a silver platter, you have momentary blessing from it, but it doesn't change you. It doesn't force you to tap into your own resources and find the strength within to deal with the problem. So Moses and Aaron, as they are going into the land of Israel, make a decision. And they say, these children that we are now bringing into the land of Israel, when they go into the land of Israel, they will not be able to withstand all that is needed if it's always given to them on a silver platter. This is true if it's the blessing that the water gives, and this is true the Torah that they would understand or anything that they would accomplish. Anything that is given to us from on high is like rain. It's it's only there, it's, uh, it's only there as long as it's given to us. The minute it is gone, it is gone. And the minute it stops, it stops. It's a, it's, it's a dew that comes from heaven. But when we work at something, and this is true for something physical and something spiritual, when it comes from our own work, when it comes from our own uh, um, uh, struggle, it, it, we, we, we develop ownership. Now, the, the Kabbalah talks about this, this uh, at great length. Again, it's very esoteric, that there is a notion that something that is handed to you on a silver platter is not good for you uh, because you, it's a crutch. And ultimately, that crutch is going to wear itself thin, and then you will be left to your own devices, which have not been developed and you're left on your own. It's like a child who is pampered by the parents all the way into adulthood. The mother that runs and does everything for the child and then cripples the child, the helicopter parent that cripples the child. And so when the child is finally on their own, they are really struggling and incapable of overcoming a challenge. It becomes overwhelming. So what Moses did was by striking the rock, which is a symbolic idea, which represents something greater, which is, represents the idea that no, you have to work for the Torah. I'm not going to give it to you on a, on a silver platter. Moses knew, okay, according to the Rebbe Rashab, according to the, this, this, this idea in the, in the, uh, on some level, okay? So we're, we're, we're talk, when we talk about esoteric ideas, we, we're not talking shot. But on some level, Moses and Aaron knew that what they were doing was tough love. And that tough love would render them unable to bring the Jewish people into the land of Israel, but it would ultimately make the Jewish people stronger and able to stand on their own two feet in the land of Israel. And even by not going into the land of Israel with them, they would force the Jewish people to find the strength within themselves. And as a leader who truly wanted to develop the Jewish people to the nth degree, they were ready to lose the opportunity to go into the land of Israel if it meant that the Jewish people would go into the land of Israel more independently, more on their own strength and stronger. And as we know, as parents or as people who nurture, let's say someone else's children, if we, have, we don't have children, if we have nieces and nephews, or if we have uh, godchildren, if we have someone in our life that we nurture, or it could be our students in school, or it could be someone that we love, that, that Sometimes we will say to the child, no, I can't give in to what you need. I can't give you what you want. 
because I need you to face the struggle on your own. And that is a lot harder than giving the child, your friend, your lover, whatever it is, your, the, 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 the thing that they're asking for. And sometimes, even if you know that the price that you're going to pay is that that child is going to be disconnected from you or that person is going to be disconnected from you. And in the case of Moses and Aaron, they're not going to go into the land of Israel. Then if you're really concerned about the long-term well-being of this child, of this person, of this friend, then you will do the hard thing by you so they could be stronger in the long term. So the teaching of the Rebbe Rashab in a mimer, he doesn't go into all of these ideas of well, the anger and he should have done it this way and maybe he missed opportunity and it was, it was the words that he used and so on and so forth. He said, no, no, no. Moses did something that was good for the Jewish people but hard for him, which is he was going to do something that was going to disqualify him from going to the land of Israel because it was ultimately going to be something that would make them stronger. Because by hitting the rock, which represents Torah, he didn't give them the Torah. He didn't give them it on a silver platter, but he made it so they would have to be forced to find it on their own. And through that kind of tough love, he made them a viable people, a people that could stand on their own two feet and not a, a people that was forever on a crutch for Moshe. And maybe what Moshe was realizing, and this is my own thought, is that as he's bringing the Jewish people into the land of Israel, you see, they're crying to Moses. Um, yes, we'll get into that. He's, he's crying to Moses. Moses, you know, we, sh we can't, we can't, we can't. And you're like, hey, Jewish people, you're still crying to Moses. You, you're, you're crying to Moses like, you, you know, like you just left. Why this? We had, we, we don't see palm trees. We, and you're saying to yourself, like, Grow up, right? Why are you, you you're always angry at Moses? It's almost like Moses is their crutch. And what Moses is saying is, I'm going to make it so that you don't have me as a crutch. You're going to have to put your own two feet on the ground. This is the teaching of the Rebbe Rashab. I found it was very interesting that this is the teaching that the Rebbe chooses to share in this instance. Obviously, the Rebbe has other interpretations as well. But in this instance, the Rebbe chooses to teach this. Because the Rebbe, more than anyone else, understood the notion of leadership because he was really the quintessential leader. And it, it, it's, it's no accident um, that this teaching is taught. If someone asked the question, I'll address the question in a minute, the fact that we know that Moses, um, uh, very good question, that the Jewish people plead on Moses' behalf. And also Mo, we know that Moses himself pled on his own behalf to go, to go into the land of Israel. So obviously this is on a, on a, it's, it's a truth on a, on, on a spiritual level, uh, uh, a, a letter. Yes, and God is Rachamim and all that. We're going to get into, I'll get into your questions in a minute. But I, but I would like to say this, and I think that I was, I was looking at what piqued me, really what piqued my interest in this interpretation that the Rebbe brings in a sicha, in, in a teaching, that he quotes the fifth of Chabad Rebbe on this teaching, is this, that this notion of, as a leader, I'm going to do something hard and make you, empower you, the, the, the instinct of those who love others or care for others is to protect them. That, that is the instinct. You know, um, I know that the, 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 certainly I know my instinct is, like uh, my, my grandmother would say, far from the veg, you know, make it smooth for you, you know, <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll order the things that you forget to order and I'll, I'll put that thing in your backpack before you leave and just make it sweeter for you because I'm, because I'm there to nurture you. And the harder thing is to say, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to let you find your, your own voice. And I think it's very interesting that the Rebbe is the one who, who brings his teaching, the, the, pre, the fifth Chabad Rebbe, but he brings his teaching because what the Rebbe is saying is that the, 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 the strength of a, a true leader is that they're ready to take a hit to make their people stronger. That means that they're ready to, it, 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 as painful as it is, to withhold, they're going to do it if it's going to make a person stronger. And I think that really bespeaks something about the Rebbe's leadership. One of, you know, uh, on Shabbat, it was 
the 28th anniversary of the Rebbe's passing. So people are all over the world coming to New York and praying, and there's a lot of talk about the Rebbe's greatness. And one of the things that uh, uh, really struck me is this, that uh, I, I once saw this on the video clip, I was trying to find it to share it with you, I couldn't find it. There's a, there's a city controller in New York um, who, who goes by the Rebbe after 19 years. He, I think he was on the board of the Jewish Education and then he became a city controller. He was involved in politics. And he, he was by the Rebbe and 19 years later, he came to visit the Rebbe. And the 19 years before, when he had visited the Rebbe, the Rebbe had had a conversation with him about something. And 19 years later, he finds himself in, on Sunday dollars when Rebbe would greet people and give them an opportunity to speak to him, when Rebbe would give dollars for him to give to Staka. And the, the Rebbe sees him and he says, you know, Rebbe, like, um, they, said, you know, they introduce him. This is, uh, you know, sometimes when important people came in, there would be someone in the community that would say, Rebbe, this is the uh, city controller of New York. He's responsible for such and such. And the Rebbe smiled and the Rebbe said, yes, I, um, I, um, I just want to ask you regarding the conversation that we had on Jewish education and so on and so forth, was there any movement on this? Some kind of question that the Rebbe asked them. And essentially what happened was as Rebbe asked them a question regarding the conversation that they had 19 years before. And the Rebbe didn't have a warning that this guy was coming. He wasn't told, oh, by the way, book your calendar. And the Rebbe could check his calendar and say, who's this dude? Oh yeah, he was the one I spoke to about this and that. So this guy passes by the Rebbe and Dollars. We're talking about one person coming after another, after another, after another. And he said, the Rebbe says to him, oh, regarding the conversation, yes, Rebbe says, I know, I remember when you were here and we had this conversation and whatever happened with this and this and that. I don't remember the exact words, but that something of that effect. And you can see the look of astonishment on this man's face. And he says, wow. He says, that is amazing. He says, I, I don't know when, when I was here last, I think it was 19, 20 years ago that we had this conversation. And he said, you've seen so many people since. And he said, and you remember the conversation? He goes, this is just amazing. And he says to the Rebbe, you're amazing. You know, you're amazing. <laughs> so he tells the Rebbe. And the Rebbe gives him a big smile. And the Rebbe says, and what benefit to the Jewish people is it that I am amazing. And he says to him, but if something good can happen as a result, that if I can cash it in, the Rebbe says, that something good could be done for the Jewish people as a result of this encounter, then it will be worth it. And this story was every time someone starts speaking about the greatness of the Rebbe, I always think about the story. The Rebbe says, okay, so I'm amazing. Whoopie doo. So how does this help the Jewish people? <laughs> And I wanted to find this video clip because I thought it, it really speaks about what leadership is. In other words, it's not about me. It's got to be about what's needed for the Jewish people. And this is what I was thinking about, that the, the most unlikely of people were, 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 were touched by this message because what the Rebbe said, essentially, as a leader, he said, I'm not here to be here as a leader, to, to lead you. I'm here to demand leadership from you. And you all have to be a leader. My son-in-law said this week in Shul, Shabbos, he said that every single person can be that leader, that spiritual leader. And people say, what? Who, me, not me, who am I? And he was saying essentially that if you look at the, the shluchim of the Rebbe, if you look at the Rebbe's emissaries, there's a few exceptional ones, but by and large, and I say this with a lot of respect, they're just regular people. <laughs> they we are, really are the most regular people that were just inspired to say, you, 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 you could do something. And what inspired them? It wasn't that the Rebbe said to, to the person, you know, I believe in you, you have so much strength. Because then the person will say, well, I don't, I really am, I'm not qualified. I am not qualified to do this. No, 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 I'm, I'm who am I? I'm a nobody. Don't ask someone who's qualified. The way Moses said, 
you know, shlach no tishlach. Send someone who's more qualified. I, I can't speak well. That's what Moses says about himself. The Rebbe didn't say that. The Rebbe said, you have a responsibility. That's it. And, and that's what he felt about himself. He felt, I have a responsibility. My father passed away. There was no one else to do it. That's what the Rebbe said when he became leader. He said, when they lock the store and they put the key in your pocket, you have to open the store. So what the Rebbe did was, he, there was tough love. The Rebbe said, you have a responsibility. And when you say, no, 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 I don't, I don't have what it takes. He says, not true. You have a responsibility. And then you're going to find what it takes. And that's the greatness of a Jewish leader. This is what I was thinking about. A lot of people say, oh, look what Chabad does all over the world. I'm telling you, as a, as, as a colleague of many of these people, and, and I say this with the greatest respect, we're just average people. There are a few great Jewish leaders in the Chabad movement, but there's, there's thousands of us. We're just regular dudes. We're just regular girls, truly and truly. And what happened? What happened was that we were told you have a responsibility. And then it's not about, oh, because you have talent, because you could deny your talent. You say, I don't have talent. No, 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 no. I have, someone's more talented than me. Well, maybe I have a little bit of talent, but not this much. And, and anyway, I, I'm, I can't do this. But when you're told you have responsibility, then you can do this. And that is, that is what a Moshe does. Moshe, basically what he did with the Jewish people, according to the Rebbe Rashab in this esoteric meaning, was that he gave them tough love in the sense that he said, I'm gonna, I'm not gonna make it, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna spoon feed you. You have to find the leadership within yourself. And this speaks to me a lot because I know for myself, if someone would have told me when I was 20 that I would be giving classes, um, I would be speaking in public, I would say, no way, Jose. I was shy as shy comes. I was, I, when I was in high school, when my teacher called on me, I would turn red and blush when I have to speak. That's, that, I love my books. I loved ideas. I could sit with my books for hours on end. I was very much a book lover. I, I couldn't get, I couldn't read enough, actually. Uh, that was my greatest challenge. But to tell me that I'm going to, you know, and I'm going to be a teacher and I'm going to be, a, I'm, I'm going to speak and I'm going to speak publicly. I would say, absolutely not. You're talking about someone else. And they would say, oh, but you have the talents. I would say, oh, no, 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 no. Not me. Not me. Ask my sister. She's very sociable. She's very outgoing. I'm a shy girl. I'm a shy girl. And I'll be a mommy. I'll, I'll take care of my babies. I love my little dolls when I was a girl. I was a shy child. And that, that was not what was told to me. What was told to me was that you have a responsibility. And so you don't have to be perfect. You just have to, you have to share what you know. And it's not about comfort. It's about responsibility. That was the message of the Rebbe. Responsibility. It's your responsibility. And that was the message of Moses. It's your responsibility, Jews. I can't spoon feed you. And that's the message for all of us. So a lot of times people will say to me, and I, I, I shared this on Shabbat in Shul, and someone said to me, you're not going to tell me that you're shy. I'm sorry, Deborah, I'm not, I'm not buying that for a second. Impossible. Like, I, don't. Okay, meet my friends in high school. They'll tell you. <laughs> They'll tell you. Um, that's, that is the truth. The truth is that how did I become a teacher of Torah? I was told you have a responsibility, you have to do it, because you know Aleph, because I said, I don't know enough, and that was for sure my, my sense, I don't know enough, so I think the message is so powerful, and I, I would like to take this message and share it with every single one of you, every single one of you is an ambassador of God, every single one of you is an ambassador of goodness, every single one of you is an ambassador of Torah, every single one of you is an ambassador of good deed, no one should say I'm not. No one should say I can't. I think the, the greatest message that the Rebbe gave us, and I'm saying this because this Shabbos was his yard site, so it's a time to, to reflect on the teachings and what the teachings have to go forward. And I, I know this. If the Rebbe would know that people are talking about him, 
he would say, so, and how does this help the Jewish people? So, so there was a great Jewish leader that you admired and how does this help the Jewish people? Or we say in, in Hebrew, uvechein, and therefore what? If it doesn't change us, if it doesn't bring out the leadership within us, then it, it's not fair. And I think that the fact that Rebbe touched this much is he said that a Moses is ready to say, I'm, I'm going to give you tough love. I'm going, to, I'm going to make you find within yourself that leadership. That is the message of, of the Rebbe, and that's the message of ultimately, it's the last message of Moses, and he's ready not to go into the land of Israel, so to speak, on an esoteric level. Now, someone asked a question before, but you see that Moses prayed to go into the land of Israel, or th didn't the Jewish people pray for Moses to go into the land of Israel? These are all things that can exist simultaneously. Because on a certain level, Moses knew what, was he, what he was doing was, a, it says, this is the esoteric teaching, obviously, not the obvious teaching, that he was doing something that was going to strengthen the Jewish people, which may disqualify him also from going into the land of Israel, but so be it, if that would mean the viability of the student, the viability of the Jewish people. So the message for every single one of us is this. Every single one of us has leadership in, it, in ourselves. And if we look at it and we'll say, no, 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 who am I? But if we see ourselves in terms of responsibility, then we turn around and we say, is there someone in my vicinity that is a Jew that is not so connected to Judaism that I could bring into my orbit? Is there someone who I can show something about Judaism? Can I invite them to my Shabbat table? God needs every single one of us to make this world a better place. And so we could say, but I'm not, I'm not a teacher, or I'm not a leader, but we all are really on one level. And what we do is what we, if we could, it, it could be something very small. It could be inviting a next door neighbor for a Shabbat meal and saying, well, I'm not a rabbi. I'm not going to, no, you can, you, you, you can have a conversation with someone. You can teach someone. We all have that ability. And that is really the teaching that I think Moses is giving it's one of his last great acts that Moses is giving to the Jewish people at this time. And I think it's a message that, we, that is a tough message. It's a message that we push back against. We don't want to accept this. And I can hear you saying, no, Devorah, you're different. And I'm going to tell you, I am not different. I was just a shy little girl <laughs> who was told you have to teach Torah. And by teaching Torah, I became a teacher. And that is true for all of us. So whether it's teaching someone, inviting someone to our home, sharing the beauty of Shabbat with someone, making a, make, becoming an ambassador of, of goodness for someone else. And it could be the little things and the big things. Like I mentioned many times, you know, one of the things that gives me great pleasure to do, and this is on a very, very, very micro level, very, very small level, but still I think it creates little waves is that if I'm driving and someone's trying to turn, I, I, I try to let them in, to go in before me and wave at them to say, come on, go in. And, uh, and the reason I do that is because I know what it does to people, because I know what it does to me. You're like, oh, people are good. There's humanity. And you know what? I'm going to do that to someone else. And so really that's the message. It's, you know, um, I think Ronald Reagan used the uh, terminology trickle down poverty. He said that you, know, you want people to have money because, you know, because, uh, you know, uh, a high tide, you know, raises, rises all ships. And I would say trickle down, trickle down Torah, that we, 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 it trickles to us and we have to let it trickle to others. And that's our responsibility for those who study Torah. It's our responsibility to find where we can teach it, where we can share it, and where we can share its messages so we all become ambassadors and we all become jewish leaders and that's what moses truly wanted of the jewish people for them to stand on their own two feet and that's a message that we all have to in, incorporate into our lives it's not a comfortable message it's much easier to say you teach me you show me but it is it is so important to say let's go out of our comfort zone and invite someone into a jewish practice into a kind practice, into any a, a, a teaching that will inspire them and perhaps make them an ambassador. And the beautiful thing about teaching Torah, and this is the analogy that is used, 
is that um, that the a candle does not get diminished when it it's shared. The light is shared. It just it exponentially grows. Whereas most other things, if you share, you have to split it. So if I want to share a piece of cake with you, I have to cut it in half. And if you're going to share that, you're going to have to cut it in half. And if that person is going to share it, and then ultimately it, it can only be shared through the laws of physics to a certain percentage. And then after that, you can't, you can't, you, you can't share it anymore. It's gone. Whereas a candle, the more you share, the more light that is created in this world. And I want to end off. And I, I, I apologize for going over time today, but I, you know, when we have a, a moment like like this Shabbat, where it was the yard side of the Rebbe, I think that it, it, we, um, we we have a responsibility to just make the class all the, all that more, because the reason why there is this class is directly because of the Rebbe and his and his inspiration and and the people around me who said you have a responsibility. Even this idea of going to Zoom, I remember when. Lockdown happened in March of 2020. My my husband and my son-in-law said, "You have to go immediately to Zoom." You know, and, and I was like, "Why? We'll wait. We'll wait a month. Everything will go back to normal." No, don't. We can't even miss one week. We have to go immediately to Zoom because you have a responsibility. And if I didn't have the responsibility, I would say, "Look, it's not. Something. We'll wait a month. It's okay. What will happen?" But when you have a sense of responsibility, that takes away all those things. So I just want to conclude with a story. Uh, about Yehuda Avner, a famous story, because he said it himself many times. Yehuda ha Avner was one of the great advisors um, to the prime ministers of Israel. He wrote the book, a famous book called The Prime Ministers, and a movie was made uh, based on his book, The Prime Ministers. And Yehuda Avner, when, when Menachem Begin came to New York, on one of his visits, he came to visit the Rebbe. It was, it was actually very controversial that the prime minister came to the Rebbe, and the Rebbe didn't come to the prime minister. But the prime minister came to the Rebbe, and as, a, as part of his, um, his responsibilities, he got to meet with the Rebbe privately. And uh, he was very curious about the Rebbe. He was a secular Jew. Um, he, uh, he found it interesting that this Hasidic rabbi had so much pull and so on and so forth. So he, said, he came to visit the Rebbe. He said that he said to the Rebbe, Rebbe, you know, I hear people say about you that you're a miracle worker. And... Um, and, uh, you know, are, are you a miracle worker? And if so, like what type of miracles and how do you perform miracles and so on and so forth? And he was, he was being a, a bit sarcastic, you know? Like, you know, your Hasidim say a lot of stories about you. Like, are you comfortable with the fact that they go around saying these things about you're a miracle worker? It's not very rational. And uh, the Rebbe said, I don't make, I don't, I'm, I, I, um, I'm not making miracles. I try, he said, I try to, to light a candle in the soul of a person. And if that candle is lit, that's a miracle. That's what the Rebbe said. I like to light, I, I don't remember the exact words. Something I like, to, I feel like I, I can light the soul of a person. If I do, that's a miracle. That was, that was the uh, interaction. And they had, they had a long talk. So as he was leaving the Rebbe's audience, he said farewell. And then as an afterthought, and almost a bit impish, he was walking out of the Rebbe's room, he turned to the Rebbe, he said, Rebbe, tell me, so did you like my, did you like my candle? And uh, the Rebbe said to him, I gave you, I gave you a match, but you have to strike the match and it's the, the it the uh, you it's your it's your responsibility to strike that match and and see the light. And I think that really sums it up for Moshe in this story. Moshe was saying to the Jewish people, "You you have to become stronger. You can't keep complaining. You're not going to be able to go into the land of Israel and whine. You can't build a country from crying. You can't complain. It's okay when you're a child." Mommy, I want this. I'm hungry. Give me this. Or I need this. Or I'm in a bad mood. This is okay when you're in a beginning stage of a relationship, when you're in infancy, when you're in childhood. But when you become a nation and you're going to build a country, you can't whine anymore. You can't come running to Moshe and cry. I need you to be stronger than that. I need you to take ownership. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you some tough love. 
And if I pay the price, so be it. Because what I was always interested from the very beginning, God gave me this mission is that you should be a strong people with your own connection to God. And, and what we own and what we develop on our own truly becomes eternal. And it's something that can never be taken away from us. And, and this is the greatest gift that we can give ourselves. And this is the greatest gift that we can give those people who, are, who we are responsible to, that we should empower them to find their own strength and to stand on their own two feet. This is true physically, but it's also true spiritually. And then also to say about ourselves, am I? Am I the Moses? Am I the person that Moses wants me to be as a Jew? Can I be also a Moses to someone else? And the answer always is yes. On some level, all of us can do something more. And I think if that's one lesson we learn about the Rebbe's life, and if that's one lesson that we take to heart, it's a lesson that is a gift that keeps on giving because we become greater as a result of, the, of knowing our responsibility and our capacity. So that is my inspiration that I, uh, that I really felt reading this very fascinating account of Moses striking the rock and why he did it. And to me, yes, it always remains an enigma, but that's probably the best explanation that Moses himself, Moses himself knew that he was not just playing with water, but he was playing with fire and he was ready to do it. It meant that the Jewish people would become a stronger people as a result. A completely different reading, but a very, uh, I think an inspirational one and one that we could all take to heart in what we, what we call making a cheshbon hanefesh, taking stock of our life and trying to make that something that really resonates in our day-to-day -day existence. So uh, as a conclusion, I will say this to, to the Miriam of this, uh, to, the Mir to Miriam, I would like to just pay homage to Miriam for whom we had the water in the desert 40 years, and Miriam is really the, the epitome of Jewish femininity and Jewish womanhood, and that water is life. So to the Jewish woman and the life and the water that she brings, and all the more so the inspiration to know that we can find that water because that water was Miriam's water. It was her well, and by extension, it's all our wells. So that is something that we can take to heart. Thank you very thank much you, for joining thank everyone. You, I wish you thank you so much. And I have a question. Sure. Um, last Monday, I couldn't attend the lesson and I was really missing it. But I can see on my tablet, it's recording. Yes, I, you so know what, I, 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 I apologize. I, you know what, my, my, my kids were going to camp and I was, uh, I, I, I didn't, you know, I saw your email. Okay, but okay. I, will, I, will, I, will send, I will send you a, a copy of it. Yeah, I because just, I, I send you, I send yes, you a letter. Yes, yes, and yes. I, I, maybe yes, I do keep a copy of it. I do keep a copy of it, so I'll be happy to send that to you. Thank you so much. Okay, thank yes you. Yes, you're Beautiful. Okay. Yes, you're okay. okay, have a have a blessed weekend. Wow. Thank you, thank you, thank, thank you. you. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. Um